I'm Wayne Hepler, and this is Feedback. There's some pretty wild people in our studio today, and actually they're all around you, but you may not know it. And we thought we would introduce you today on Feedback, as Scott McDaniel is our guest, the president, creative media director, and co-founder of the Susquehanna Wildlife Society. Scott, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming in. So before listeners might run from the radio saying, boring, going to talk about nature, birds and turtles. I mean, you must get this in some way, shape, or form, although when you do classrooms and kids, I'm sure, you know, it's all exciting. Thanks for bringing the critters and, you know, go out for walks. I'm sure that's great. But how do you get adults to, in essence, sign on? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with heritage and understanding that part of our local you know, history is also wildlife. And I think getting that connection that people have. Everyone has seen something in their backyard. Everybody's seen something crossing the road. They've had encounters with wildlife at some point or another. And just connecting people to those things and getting them to understand that we all can do a part in um, making this a better place for all of us. I think that does resonate to a lot of people. I suspect, but I wouldn't know, that you get people who maybe get caught up in, for example, the video I watched online about the muskrat on Route 40, which I found to be a really interesting video. And I'm thinking, boy, I hope this has a happy ending. I don't think they'd put it on here if it didn't. But I, I would imagine when we get caught in situations like that, where and we'll tell people how they can see the video as we come through, we see the muskrat alongside the road. He's trapped. He clearly has got a big cement block between him and what looks like natural habitat over yonder. And if he crosses the traffic, chances aren't good, but better over there because might get to the water kind of thing, right? And we all sit there panicked, but we don't slow down. doesn't seem safe. What do you do with the muskrat anyway if you get it, right? Most people aren't going to say, here, little muskrat, you know, and exactly. hop in, right? Um, so we get stuck in those situations. What do you do with a puppy on the highway kind of thing? And then you drive off, and you want to forget that. You don't want to think about the likely possibility of what happened to the muskrat, the puppy, what have you. And then we put it out of our minds. And then you come along and say, you know, you need to think about this, right? So is that part of the way this goes? It really is. And that's part of the reason we were founded was actually the, the kind of who, who do you call question. And uh, we found ourselves personally in a lot of situations where we said, oh, I guess the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, they handle all of these calls. You assume they do. They don't have the manpower to do it. You know, there's after hours calls. There's things where... A lot of people have good hearts and they do things with wildlife, but they just don't have the capability of going out and doing these rescues. So it's more about arming the general public with either here's how you can help when these situations arise to kind of in, you know, imprint those uh, ideas and those concepts in people's heads or give them an easy way to contact someone. So they call us. We're going to answer, and we're going to come out and help, or at least give them advice over the phone. Scott McDaniel is the president and co-founder of the Susquehanna Wildlife Society, and I'm gathering that people call you come? They do. That's and how it works? And we do. And is it the hotline they would call or something else? It's the hotline. So that is 443-333-WILD. That's pretty memorable, right? 443-333-WILD. And I call, and what will I hear? You will either get an answer right away, or you'll get a call back within minutes. And what that is, is it rings to uh, most of our board members uh, when someone calls. What it does is we will answer and we'll assess the call and see if it's something we can jump on. We're all volunteers, so it depends on where we're at at that moment. But we'll collaborate and figure out the best way to go after that animal or direct you to the right person or group that can help. Or even a lot of times we get calls and we tell people just to leave them alone. Caring people call. But we say, hey, you know, the mother's around just because you don't see her. She's not gone. She'll be back to help that baby bunny or squirrel or whatever it might be. Or put the bird back in the nest. Let the mother do her job. That kind of thing. So we do get a lot of calls where we actually kind of just discuss how to, you know, leave wildlife wild instead of bringing it into captivity where it needs to be rehabilitated and things like that. And educating people always, again, sounds like another cliche, kind of snoozeville, but fact of the matter is education is really important when you tell people these kinds of things like leave that critter alone yeah, everything's really okay that's good to know it is and it's something that a lot of us come in that situation and we don't know you, you always heard that don't touch a baby bird because the mother won't come back that's actually not true they don't really smell the person sent on the baby birds it doesn't really affect the mother and her ability to care for the young but you've heard that pretty much your whole life probably mm -hmm. sure i did until i found out you know that wasn't actually true all right so i need you to give me the good bad news here and I'm afraid it might be more bad than good. But here we go, because this is real life. For years, I've got a deck in the back of my house. 
And uh, Red Robin has come along and built a nest uh, April, usually. And uh, usually it's in a location that's not particularly advantageous to my Boston Terrier. My Boston Terrier is, you know, maybe the size of a bread box. But, of course, in the mirror it thinks it's seeing Great Dane. So Boston Terrier thinks, you know, the world is its. And then dive-bombing Robin comes along when dog goes downstairs reasonably close to nest and mom thinks, you know, you're a threat, right? Well, I moved the nest this year to another point on the deck. And lo and behold, not too long later, I see eggs in it. So I figure mom took well to it, right? Yeah. Well, just in the last week, uh, mom, meaning wife, found nest overturned on the ground, presumably eggs long gone. What do you think happened? Uh, if you move the nest, it may have not been properly attached. And I sure possible. tried, but I hear you. But, it, you know, they have a certain way of building it, you know, and if you moved it, uh, a, a wind gust could have knocked it down. Uh, there's other birds that will go into nests, too, and raid them, you know, crows, things like that. So animals have a lot stacked against them, natural and human-induced. So the good news is species like that, there's a lot of them. That they're pretty resilient. The next year, she'll find a better spot to nest. We often tell people how to block things off. If an animal's getting in into their way uh, or in threat because of their pets, we'll say, hey, you can you can help move it over here, kind of redirect them to a better spot. And they do that a lot. Osprey nests, you'll see them building on, on a roof of a building on Route 40 somewhere, and they've had to build platforms to kind of say, hey, this is a much better spot than on the top of a real estate office or mm-hmm. something like that. So we've seen that happen, and it actually does work. Uh, the wildlife is pretty adaptable. Scott McDaniel is our uh, president and co-founder of the Susquehannock Wildlife Society. Something else I want to get to here is uh, you are the director and conservation committee chair of the Mid-Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Society. One has to ask, what is that all about? So we have a partner group, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Turtle and Tortoise Society, which is also called MATS. Um, and I actually got involved with them before we started Susquehannock Wildlife Society. It's a local conservation group, and they also deal with uh, proper care of pet turtles. Had turtles since I was a little kid. It was always a fascination, and I found this group, and they're really good-hearted people that actually do a lot of rescues, people that don't want to keep turtles anymore as pets, and try to stop them before they let them go into the wild, which most of the time are not native species, and people don't understand that, and they just release them out into the waters of our local ecosystem, and it causes big problems. People also buy pets impulsively, and they don't realize they live for 50, 60 years, and have pretty uh, extensive requirements for their housing and care. So... Uh, this group tries to do education for that. I'm more on the conservation side. I like to work with Maryland DNR and other groups to protect turtle habitat and, and kind of educate people on the native species that we have right here in uh, Maryland. What goes on to actually tracking and taking care of a species that seems, when all said and done, outside of a shell, you know, pretty vulnerable to what might happen to it, right? Not only humans, but even in nature. Sure. Our research coordinator, Hunter Hell, is leading a project. He's a Towson University student. And he is doing a project on the spotted turtle, which is a rare and declining species um, across a lot, lot of its range, actually. It's a wetland species. Uh, and with destruction of wetlands, they've seen big declines and road mortality, they hit by cars, and they're also collected for the pet trade. And how do we know it when we see a spotted turtle as opposed to the box? And It has quite a bit of spots on it. It's actually aptly named. Uh, it's a black shell with bright yellow spots on oh, it. It's sure. actually a very attractive turtle and very okay. small which also makes it attractive for the pet trade. But thanks for naming it, because heaven knows I've seen it, but I never knew what I saw. Yeah, and they're, um, they're pretty rare, um, rarely seen. Uh, they are in Hartford County, and we have some populations that actually were monitored back into the 80s. And we found the research that was done in the 80s, and we contacted the researcher who had since moved away. We got all their data, and then we picked up the project now so that we could see if we could find those same individuals that were marked. So when we say monitored, We find individuals actually have uh, etchings in their shell that give them a specific number. And then if we find an individual again, 10, 20, 30 years later, that gives us its age, that lets us see how it's doing, that it's still made it, that's around. Or when we don't find individuals 10, 20 years later, we can look at what happened. Did the forest kind of encroach in on those wetlands? So now they're too shaded and turtles can't bask can't lay their eggs and things like that. Well, might you just be in a situation, though, where a turtle wandered off, and so you might not expect to find it? It's possible. Um, They do move from wetland to wetland sometimes, but certain populations do have home ranges, and they do stick to them to some degree. So if you have a population of 100 turtles, uh, and you go back 20 years later, and you can only find 20 turtles, you can start correlating data. Um, And you also, if you're finding new turtles, you're finding babies, now you know that they're recruiting, that they're breeding, and that's a good sign. So when we're monitoring turtles, we're looking at their populations and seeing how they're doing 
rather than just saying a lot of studies show presence absence, which is very deceiving. You find one turtle and you go, oh, there's a spotted turtle here. There's a wood turtle here. There's a bog turtle here. They're doing fine because I found one. There might only be three turtles in that whole population. Mm -hmm. And two years later, they're all gone. Right. But there may be a hundred of them. So there is a lot of value in understanding how large a population is, if it's growing, if it's shrinking, and what those factors might be. Engaging what a find really means, which I imagine must be quite exciting when you turn a turtle loose in 2006 and 10 years later, look, there it is. It is very, very exciting. Um, and we have found turtles that were marked in the 80s that we found again. So that's very positive. But we've also seen trends that the population may be much smaller than it was back then before you know, development went in and some other factors that may have contributed to the decline. The hotline for the Susquehannock Wildlife Society is 443-333-WILD. It's pretty easy to remember, 443-333-WILD. And if people wish to find you online, I know you've got Facebook, other ways to find you. What, where yeah, do we go? We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Vine, and our website is www.suskywildlife.org. And that's spelled? S-U-S-K-Y wildlife.org or susquehannockwildlife.org. And then if you really want to be forgetful, you can type in hartfordwildlife.org, and it goes to us too. Marylandwildlife.org also goes to us. So we try to make it easier for people to find us and get information about it, wildlife. It wasn't hard. When I did my own searching, you came up. Yeah, first or third, usually, in, in the entries, and that's always a positive thing. Yep. So you are a Maryland master naturalist, courtesy of the University of Maryland Extension, the Maryland DNR, and that's been for a couple of years for you now. Correct. And uh, maybe you can fill us in. You're also a former Eagle Scout. Good for you. So this, uh, this for you has been a lifelong kind of channel. It really has. And, you know, I wanted to do something more formal. I'm, I'm, I'd say mostly self-taught, but that's not really true because I, I spend time around a lot of people that know a lot more than me. And they, they teach me a lot of things about wildlife and I experience things on my own. So part of being a naturalist is going out and, and seeing things and analyzing them and learning everything you can about the natural world. Uh, I wanted to formalize that a little bit. So I, I got involved with the Master Naturalist Program. Maryland DNR was uh, hosting it that year that I did it. So I got to kind of strengthen my skills at identifying and providing education to the public. Is that the real core of becoming that? It really is. And uh, it's really about education and it's about, it's also about science. So it's mixing science and education into kind of one, um, one field. And that's something I'm really interested in. I'm not the researcher in the group. We have researchers and biologists. We have uh, our education coordinator, Andrew Adams, is very focused on our education piece, but also he does research. He has a biology background. I come from more um, electronic media and the naturalist perspective, where it's going out and helping to identify things and, and wanting to take that message to the public of what we find and give them little bits of information that they can find useful. As a mass comm professor here at Hartford Community College, I see many students go on to EMF, as we call it, electronic media and film at Towson, which is indeed what you did as well. And now you're putting that to use in your own video and photography for nature. And that was something that really connected me to wildlife was being able to understand how to take a message and get it out to the public in a simple way that's interesting and entertaining. And film has always been that for me. And, and you can take any message really and, and do it with that. But I feel like wildlife, I always saw things that were really interesting to me and that I really wanted to share with other people. And the way I, I've been able to do that is through photography and even more so through film. These unique perspectives that only you can get with a camera that you can see what a turtle sees, that you can see what a snake sees, and, and see species that are rare and so hard to find that the average person will never see them unless it's through video. So that's a really, really interesting and really fun way that we've been able to connect to a lot of the public and really get our message out. Did you happen to shoot the muskrat video that I saw? I on? did. That was shooting it through my windshield as I was ushering the muskrat off the road. And I, I just, I had to do it. I felt compelled to save this animal as I saw it walking down the road into traffic. Uh, so I blocked traffic and actually had a Harford County Sheriff pull over and was like, is everything okay? What's going on here? I'm like, there's a muskrat in the road and it's getting ready to walk into traffic. I'm just trying to to usher it over to the other side so it can get to safety. And he just laughed and <laughs> waved and said, be safe. And and I was. I had my hazards on, and I was you know, trying to block traffic for it. And but still, it narrowly avoided a truck is what you said online. It almost did, yeah. It, once it crossed, you know, I got it that far. About 15 minutes was you know, kind of taking it down Route 40. And then just as it goes to, to across the oncoming traffic lane, it a truck had just come, and it just went between the tires and made it across. So oh, wow. that was a pretty uh, nerve-wracking moment. But mm -hmm. uh, I also wanted to film it because I said, you know, most people will never think to do something like this. So if I don't film it, I'm not going to be able to share this with the public. So, and I got a lot of good feedback. People said, oh, I never thought of doing that. You know, I'm not going to get out and grab this muskrat, you know, risk getting bitten or hurting the animal or risk myself going into traffic. 
So the least I could do is kind of block traffic and give it a chance. And yeah. that was something I was willing to do, and I was glad I did. How can people see more videos? So on our website, uh, there is a, a whole page dedicated to our videos. We have a YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash Susky Wildlife. Once again, everything kind of follows that. Suskywildlife.org, et cetera. Correct. So you can see our videos on there. We're, we're about to do some more. We've been collecting a lot of footage over the last year that we're going to start releasing a lot more videos in the upcoming future. Scott McDaniel, our guest on Feedback. He is the president, creative media director, and co-founder of the Susquehannock Wildlife Society. And uh, there's been, uh, I don't know, battle is the right word. I'll let you describe it. But in the last few years, there's been an effort at least to stop the turtle derbies and the frog jumping competition. That is the stuff of lore. People tend to talk about it with eyes lit up. Kids think, oh, golly, this is fun. And yet you guys are trying to bring an end to these events because of the harm they do the animals that are involved. So do tell. You know, it's one of those situations where you have a, a local tradition that's kind of coming to head with modern science. And the event itself seems very harmless. People are bringing their turtles in. They're having a good old time. It's 4th of July. Everybody's getting together. It's a very family-oriented event. And what I've seen and what we've seen around the county and the state and actually the whole East Coast is this new emerging diseases. The average person isn't going to know about diseases that are affecting reptiles and amphibians. You hear about you know viruses and diseases that affect humans, but when it comes to wildlife, you really don't hear about it for the most part. Like ranovirus. Ranovirus is, is what is affecting reptiles and amphibians. And that's spelled R-A-N-O virus. Yeah. Right. And this is apparently a potential killer to... It some, is. Some of the wildlife we've been discussing. And it'll kill entire populations, localized populations. Um, and it's been seen in Hartford County. So this isn't a hypothetical. We've actually found turtles that were tested in labs, and they were confirmed, and they died uh, from this disease. No, no cure, Scott? There's no cure. Most of the time when they're found, it's already too late, and they will, they will end up dying from it. It's, it's kind of considered like the Ebola of reptiles and amphibians. It's, it's very quick quick acting and when it gets into a, a wetland or something like that it'll actually kill entire groups of tadpoles it'll kill turtles that come in contact with it and things like that so it spreads quickly we're still learning about it which makes it even more dangerous because we don't actually don't know everything about it which is part of the reason we are so strongly trying to get the message out to the public of saying hey a lot of these turtles that are in these races they're not just pet turtles a lot of people think oh they're everybody's pets but a lot of people go out and they find a turtle specifically for this event they take it out of the wild, which that in itself is uh, harmful to the ecosystem. A lot of times it's right around the time of the year where they're laying eggs and things like that. And then they're put in these races where they come in contact with other turtles of unknown origin. It could be an African tortoise. It could be, you know, there's all kinds of diseases that can come about and then get spread back into the ecosystem when these turtles are put back into the ecosystem. And they're not always put back where they belong anyway. Correct. So there's, there's all those factors. They're not put back where they belong. And if they are, they've come in contact with other turtles, which could then spread disease on top of that. So the event itself is a catalyst for a lot of spread of disease, and we think that it's a bad idea in general. If it's just pet turtles that we know were pets, that, that might be a different story, but it's just a bad idea all around. So we've been trying to educate the public, and, and hopefully it actually will uh, very soon come to an end, I believe. I believe it will. Um, we've been working very hard on the regulation side of things, so there may be some changes in oh, really? regulations in the not-too-distant future. Because online, you have gone on to say that the Bel Air Independence Day Committee, for one, um, not just to single them out, but that is one that is singled out online, said that it was too abrupt a change to do immediately and just bring it to an immediate end. So is there progress? And that was three or four years ago. So the progress is more the, the, the scientific data has increased over the years. So we've had more cases of this disease. And even the, the committee has agreed that this is a problem. But no one wants to be the one that says it's canceled. So that's kind Basically of Basically for political and social reasons. Sure. And no one, wants to, no one wants to negatively affect the tradition. And I get that. I'm a citizen of Hartford County. Anything that brings people together is typically a good thing. But some traditions are bad. And some of them need to change. And, and I always think, what are we teaching kids? Anytime you're putting animals and you're using them for amusement and things like that, to me, we want to teach kids to appreciate wildlife in the wild and let them be the stewards of our environment, not teach them to treat them in the way that they've been treated through these events. Scott McDaniel, our guest on Feedback, the co-founder and the president, as well as creative media director of the Susquehannock Wildlife Society, which has been around for about five years now. Uh, Scott, a lifelong lover of nature. And so you, I imagine, can't be real happy with pet shops. You know, the difference with pet shops is a lot of the animals are captive bred, which is a lot different for us. 
and a lot of them aren't native species. So this isn't so much an animal rights issue or animal protection issue. It's more of a wildlife and ecosystem issue from our perspective as, as a wildlife organization. We're focused on people taking wildlife out of the wild and using them or just depleting the ecosystem of them. As so, opposed to the breeding within an organization like yeah. the companies that run the stores. If they, if they breed animals on a farm somewhere um, and then they sell them and people keep them as pets and they properly care for them, I have no problem with that. But how about the small spaces they're confined in when they're on display? It's not ideal. And, and there's definitely ways pet stores can do a better job of, of housing animals. I do have a problem when they're wild caught, though. Let's talk about the eastern hellbender and the darter. And that's the really rare one, but the hellbender has just got me on name alone. Sure. The eastern hellbender is a uh, almost two-foot-long salamander that's still found in much of the Appalachian uh, areas. Uh, it's actually still in western Maryland in Garrett County. But we have historic records that said it used to be here in the Susquehanna, too. Uh, it's a very sensitive species that needs incredibly clean water. It preys mostly on crayfish. and lives under large rocks. How these, big is this thing that it, it preys on crayfish? It's uh, two feet long. It's a, it's a oh. very large salamander, and it's, um, it's our biggest salamander in the United States. And quite incredible, and it's declining across much of its range. But here in the Susquehanna, it's especially interesting to us because it hasn't been seen in so long. And most people have assumed that it's extirpated, which means locally extinct um, and wiped out. And this could have been... Uh, Not to blame the dam, but could be from the dam. The water is being heated up, all the sediment, things like that is a possibility. Um, We also had a lot of runoff going through a lot of our tributaries over the decades that could have caused it to decline. But we haven't given up on it yet. And that's what's kind of the most interesting thing is uh, there's new techniques out. uh, It's called eDNA, which is environmental DNA uh, research, which you actually sample water and you filter it and then you send it off to a lab. And we send it off to a lab in Buffalo, New York. And they look for this DNA of the hellbender from our samples. Hmm. And we sample the water, and we send the water samples off to the lab. So instead of flipping giant rocks with uh, pry bars and, and potentially killing or disturbing habitat for these hellbenders, if they do still exist around the Susquehanna, we test the water. And if their DNA is there, they're there. If it's not there, they still could be there. I would imagine but, you might get some interesting looks if you tell somebody, I'm looking for a hellbender. You might. Um, they're actually often feared. A lot of fishermen killed them. They thought that they were venomous. They thought that they eat all their trout. At two feet. At two feet. And it's pretty... kind of menacing when you pick it up on a fish hook. Um, I would think so. Uh, so a lot, a, lot, a lot of times they're actually killed or, or thought that they were, they used to be called snot otters or Allegheny alligators and a lot of other weird names. Uh, people didn't know what they were and they were kind of afraid of them. The darter is even more rare. The Maryland darter uh, is one that we're not actually specifically involved in right now, but it's one of our kind of our target species that we've been keeping an eye out for through the public. And it's a, it's a tiny stream fish that was only found in, uh, I think, I believe it was two different creeks in Hartford County, and the only place in the entire world that this fish was found. And it was Deer Creek and, and another creek, um, it was Swan Creek, I believe, uh, years ago. And it hasn't been seen since the late 80s. It's been looked for. Um, they've done a lot of searches for it. And the populations were small back then and they believe that maybe a big storm came through or just enough pollution or or, or who knows what the cause was but this little tiny fish was only found here in Hartford County is now potentially gone. We've got a lot of land that's being eaten up for housing for development. Hartford County where we happen to live but people within the sound of our voices might be elsewhere and we're seeing the farms go away we're seeing the woods go away so that certainly must have an impact on local wildlife. It does Um, and wildlife it's very important to have uh, corridors. So when you have these developments, even though you may have a nice pond on a, in a neighborhood or a nice little patch of forest, if that forest is surrounded by roads and it's surrounded by houses and uh, shopping centers and things like that, wildlife can't move from one place to another safely. So you really need these green corridors. And Hartford County uh, government, I know, has been very focused in the state of Maryland on trying to protect a lot of these uh, green corridors and uh, river watersheds and things like that. So it's very important to develops to kind of focus on smart growth when we do grow and we do think about where to develop to see how that impacts entire ecosystems. I'm sure those discussions can be quite quite spirited. Oh, certainly. Anytime you're dealing with development or anything else, and and we're not an anti-development group and we're not an anti-hunting group or anything, we understand there's realistic ways that you have to develop a community and that people are going to engage with wildlife in different ways. Um, But I think you just have to go at it with a... um, kind of a collaborative approach so you can understand how you can protect wildlife and still uh, thrive and grow as a community.
There are events going on. You guys get out. You certainly do classroom scenes, and other people can go on walks and join you. We do. But uh, I know May 10, as we are recording here, that's the next event coming up for you. May 10 and 11, you've got the Green Turtle in Bel Air, which I find wonderfully appropriate for what you're up to. Uh, people bring in your flyer, which they can get at suskywild.org. Bring in the flyer, 20% of the sales receipt donated to the Susquehannock Wildlife Society. Correct. So just go have a nice lunch, May 10 and 11. Uh, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m., is that correct? Correct, or so lunch or dinner, uh, drinks, so whatever you want. All through the, okay, correct. right, that's a nice long time to do that, May 10 and 11, right? In June, you've got the Wildlife Paint Party Fundraiser. Correct. Right, June 4 from 3 to 6, that's June 4 from 3 to 6. You can paint a picture of your favorite Maryland wildlife and help support the up-and-coming Wildlife Center. Do tell, what about this Wildlife Center? So the Wildlife Center is kind of a culmination of one of our dreams from the very beginning when we formed. Because we always thought... We need a place to do a lot of the things we want to do. We wanted a centralized place in Hartford County to bring together people, to teach them about wildlife, to do wildlife rehabilitation, which we have a master wildlife rehabilitator on our team, Melissa Goodman, who is taking care of wildlife that's been injured or orphaned uh, to try to rehabilitate it back to health and release it. So we'll actually be able to do that there at our facility, as well as doing scientific research. So that dream kind of came to fruition last year when we partner with Maryland Department of Natural Resources to manage a 20-acre site in Darlington Hmm. that has a house and a barn. It used to be a residential home that we're converting into a wildlife center, uh, little by little, piece by piece. And uh, we're doing these fundraisers to try to raise the money to convert these uh, these structures into something where we can have displays and and live animals that people can see that are of the rare species that we're kind of been talking about, as well as do the the actual hands-on rehabilitation and scientific research. And again, people can go to suskywildlife.org if they'd like more information, or they can email, if people can catch this by ear, melissagoodman13 at gmail.com for chosen photos and any further questions. And all of this regarding the Wildlife Paid Party Fundraiser on June 4, which is a fundraiser to make that center go. And finally, on June 17, you've got the Night with the Wild Gala. I love the name of that. From basically 7 till just about midnight. And uh, that one sounds pretty interesting. The Ultimate Ambassador for Wildlife will be announced during the gala, among other things. Can you fill us in? Uh, It's our first really big fundraiser that we're really putting together. And this is to really get the money that we need to really move forward with our wildlife center. We have a group of people called the Wild Bunch that we've assembled, and they're different teams uh, from all over, and they're going out and raising money for us. So that's what the the Ultimate Wildlife Ambassador is all about. Uh, These teams are going out and raising money for us separately leading up to the event. It's $80 a person. We still have some tickets left. We're trying to sell out this event quickly, and it is starting to sell out. We're looking to fill the place, have a great time. We're going to have auctions. We're going to be talking about the center and our dreams and all the the vision that we've put together for this place. We're going to have live animals there for people to photograph while they're wearing their fancy gowns and uh, and tuxes. So we're we're kind of going formal, but we're also kind of mixing up a little bit and uh, a little bit down to earth at the same time. So uh, that's kind of the people we are. So we want people to come and have a great time. Um, But we also want to raise money for the Wildlife Center. It takes a lot of money to do this. We're all volunteers. But we have big dreams, and we're going to make it happen, but we need the support of the community to make it happen. June 17, from 7 until approximately midnight. Should be a great night. It it does sound like quite an event. Yeah, we we certainly only wish you well. And again, suskywildlife.org. People can go there. I gave out the email earlier. And the hotline would not be used for something like this? Uh, The hotline reaches us no matter what. So if you have questions about the event, you can call uh, 443-333-WILD. If you want more information, we have tickets available online. So a lot going on. Certainly. Uh, we're very busy, but uh, we have a lot of goals, and we're, we're working hard to make them all happen. So it's really about uh, public awareness right now to know that we exist and that there is someone there uh, speaking up for wildlife in Hartford County. And that is the Susquehannock Wildlife Society now, roughly five years old, and under not the solo guidance, but the president and co-founder, Scott McDaniel, who has been our guest today on Feedback. We wish you well. Thank you. And thank you for the the drive up during your work day today to get to us for this recording. My pleasure. Feedback is a production of WHFC and is recorded on the campus of Harford Community College in Bel Air, Maryland. Feedback is produced by Justin McAllister. I'm Wayne Hepler, and we'll look for you on the next Feedback next week.